side, I've spoken on um, panels. Uh, so through MDRC and then through this uh, other organization that I serve, uh, Healthy Dearborn, uh, through um, uh, the Healthy Dearborn uh, Coalition, which is a coalition of some 200 people that has different committees. Uh, and so these committees uh, just, you know, they do different things. So they, they serve different purposes. And I'm on the Inclusive Health Committee, which is dedicated to making Dearborn more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, aside from that, I also served as a AmeriCorps member at the Detroit Health Department as a community engagement coordinator for 10 months. And um, so I uh, helped, so my primary uh, job uh, during that time was to spread awareness of culturally sensitive resources that are available to minorities and Arab American youth who are struggling with substance. After that, I accept, I recently accepted a position, I'm humbled and honored to have accepted a position with the MDRC as their gender and initiatives coordinator. And um, my job, uh, you know, with in this respect is to um, create uh, awareness and uh, create um, educational materials around uh, the in educating people around the intersections of uh, disability and gender and religion uh, within the community, particularly in the Arab American community and in other minority communities as well. And currently, I am also an aspiring social worker. So um, I have, uh, I'm, again, I'm humbled and honored to have been accepted into both Wayne State and U of M Ann Arbor's Masters of Social Work programs for the fall of 2021. And through this work, I hope to continue my disability advocacy as well as um, my background in interpersonal, um, interpersonal social work as well and, and helping uh, uh, different minorities, particularly Arab American youth fight substance use uh, or substance misuse. So that's me. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited to have you here with us. Aziza, if you could introduce yourself and kind of tell us uh, about your journey to be here with us today. Yeah, so just <clears throat> uh, for image description, I am wearing a sort of pink scarf and a lighter pink hoodie. I have some stuff in the background. It's like a fake plant <laughs> and my coffee pot. Um, still haven't figured out the Zoom background situation. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you. Um, I'm not as nearly as accomplished as Hela, um, but thank you for the organizers. I am humbled to participate in this discussion today. Um, I am Aziza Nassar. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the manager of quality assurance and improvement at the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Um, currently, I lead um, all of the quality management initiatives for the housing programs. Um, we have five different supportive housing programs designed to serve people that are homeless or at risk of homelessness in the greater Chicagoland area. Um, we have a dozen of different programs and they range from low touch to, to higher, um, you know, higher touch and uh, just under a thousand housing subsidies. Um, I'm a Muslim woman with a disability. I was diagnosed uh, at the age of nine and started using a wheelchair at the age of 15. Um, I have muscular dystrophy. Um, so what is quality management? It's uh, basically a framework that is designed to ensure that the systems that we have in place are working for the individuals that it's designed to serve, right? So this happens at a number of different levels, right? So when you're talking about program management or you know, ensuring compliance or safety reporting, um, my position sort of looks at these different systems that are in place and tries to think, you know, are we accountable? Are we serving the people that we're actually trying to serve through a data lens? Um, so prior to that, I was a case manager um, and I worked 
in a different department at the AIDS Foundation, mostly serving individuals with um, HIV AIDS or um, susceptible to HIV. Um, and so I did that for about a year. Um, the bulk of my time has been spent working for my local SIL, uh, Center for Independent Living, um, Access Living, uh, in a number of different capacities, right? So I worked on healthcare, employment, um, legal, civil rights, transportation, and housing. Um, all these things sort of play into each other. But um, so that's really been my experience. Um, and then prior to that, I was I um, was a scientist, kind of still am by trade, and I graduated from Loyola University with a molecular biology and chemistry um, background, and I was pre-med in, in college. So I'll stop there. Um, I'm sure I'll get into more about who I am in the discussion, um, but I'm very happy and excited to be here today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, welcome to both of you. Uh, and a couple of more administrative housekeeping things as we kind of settle in. Closed captioning is available for those who do need it. There should be a button at the bottom of your screen for closed captions, so you can click on that. Um, we also are streaming live on Facebook, so please do uh, feel free to comment and share this and like this on there as well. Um, and thank you, Aziza, for modeling a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I, off, I definitely want to give my own image description as well, and then also give Hala a chance before we move into the conversation. Um, so this is Numira, and I have a white background behind me in terms of the walls. One of my mom's plants is in the corner because she has the green thumb in the family. Um, and I'm wearing a black headscarf uh, with a necklace that has pearls in it. Um, she, her pronouns as well for myself. Hala, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit with that image description as well. Oh, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Hala. Um, so I am sitting on a brown couch against a um, orange wall background. And there is a picture of my high school graduation, uh, like self portrait above my head. Um, and I am uh, currently I have a bun and my hair like in a, I've styled my hair in a bun style. Um, and I have a multicolored shirt on with glasses. Thank you. Yes, we are all rocking glasses today. So, <laughs> which I think opens up a really great kind of question around accessibility. I know many educators often use glasses, right? And um, visual impairments is a, a des description of what accessibility looks like, right? Imagine a world where children were not being able to be tested for glasses and outfitted with glasses. How would that look? How, how accessible would that world be? Uh, and so I think that's such an important kind of point around this. Um, for myself as well, by way of introduction, um, I have had fibromyalgia for about 10 years now, and I'm a COVID long hauler. So you know, we're going to be bringing in a number of, of topics around disability and different aspects of identity as well. So I wanna open it up with that question around just the development that each of you have had to really think about disability identity. What has that looked like for you? Has it been something that has always been present in some form? Where did you get the language to really understand it for yourself and to talk about it with other people? Um, and what is disability identity as a phrase, right? What does that mean to you? So I'd love to open it up there. Um, whoever wants to go first. Um, Aziza, would you mind if I went first? Go for it. I was oh, hoping you would. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Um, well, for me, I guess coming into my disability was uh, quite a journey. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to be around a family that was actually very supportive of me and my goals and what I wanted to do. Um, although I didn't really, I wasn't really conscious of my disability until I actually entered school at about three years old. And then like, you know, even at three years old, I was like in a, a special needs classroom. So I wasn't really conscious of my disability back then either but then I didn't really like I guess get conscious become conscious of my disability until I was like seven years old and people children as I transitioned into mainstream education uh you know my able-bodied 
counterparts or classmates but you know they would stare they would uh, ask questions they would ask me what happened they, they would assume that um i i got this way through like an accident or or um some sort of ordeal um but for me you know it was always kind of like i had to explain oh i was born with this disability and and things like that so it was a little for me it was like okay they were asking out of curiosity but sometimes it does get a little tiring to have to explain to people you know why i use a walker and you know why you know i i have i have to use different supports around the house to walk around like i i use furniture on the house it's like our house is kind of small so i don't really use my walker and it's a, it's a ranch house so you know and and to have to explain to people oh hey you know i don't need as much support around the house but maybe like even you know with my walker i'm pretty independent but sometimes the, people look at me and they assume that i need support so it's been like quite a journey to have to explain you know i'm i'm sorry you know this is very kind of you but i i really don't need support in this way so it was it was quite a struggle for me and i tried to like make my disability as indivisible and indiv invisible as possible even though it was like hyper visible since i used a walker but i tried not to draw too much focus on that you know as a teenager and as i came into my young adult years um but then after you know uh, i didn't really embrace my identity until i actually got into university uh and then my professor pointed me to um healthy dearborn and the inclusive health committee and from there just speaking on panels with other, you know, women with disabilities and people of color with disabilities, I, I realized that my disability is actually something I should embrace. And it's not something that I should try to make invisible or run away from, because it brought me to this point. It brought me to, you know, why I ended up majoring in sociology and why I ended up like wanting to diversify my point of view and why I wanted to end up uplifting other people who couldn't advocate for themselves i i come from a supportive family so i have the resources to advocate for myself but other people do not unfortunately you know in the, in the ableist society that we live in able ableism is so ingrained in our society that you know it's very hard for people you know with limited access to resources and a limited support system to to thrive and so that, that's what brought me into social work too, because I couldn't imagine, I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to be like a, a voice for people who, who didn't have that support system. I'm very, I'm very lucky. And I, I know that despite my, my uh, challenges, I, I come from a lot of privilege compared to others. So I really want to be that voice for, for, people who, who have a, a limited amount of privilege in that aspect and in, in, in that they don't have as much. Well. Oh. So that's, does that cover it? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. And we're going to dive deeper into so many aspects of this, but you know, I want to uplift some of the comments in the chat. One person mentioned, I don't know why people think it's okay to ask strangers personal questions about their disabilities right yeah. um this is something that i know absolutely comes up in so many ways as to like who is seen as available almost for public consumption right yeah, around yeah. their identity uh and there's a lot to be said around that so i want to uplift to the fact around intersectionality and the different mm -hmm. levels of identity and how common it is for people to try to flatten individuals into yeah. one aspect of their identity right yeah. So same question for you, Aziza, around like, you know, what do you think of when it comes to identity, dis uh, disability identity, as well as what kind of brought you into that space as well? Yeah, um, sort of similar to Hada, I feel like I've had a lot of similar experiences, as I'm sure a lot of other people who sort of share our demographic or, you know, background. Um, I think what's sort of different for me is that I, even though I was born with my disability, I sort of identify as somebody who's acquired their disability later in life, um, just because I did not know that I had it. Um, so it was something that I had to learn um, as a part of who I am. 
Um, and to be honest, um, my disability identity has changed throughout my, you know, my, the, my entire um, adult life. I feel like when I first was diagnosed, um, I sort of viewed uh, my disability as something that I needed to, to fix, right? So really talking about that medical model of disability where, you know, I am the, the thing that needs to be fixed. I am broken and I need to, to figure out a way to get better from this thing that um, has caused me an, you know, impairment. Um, and so, you know, being diagnosed at nine, using a chair at 15, these are the years that, that uh, young adults start to think about what sort of direction do I want to go? Um, in terms of a career, who do I want to become as an adult? And, you know, um, and so, you know, just setting out to um, go to medical school, to go and study or be a researcher, you know, really sort of speaks to this, you know, medical model of, of framework and how I identified, right? And, and also, um, I think we were just chatting a little bit before we went live, but I also didn't really identify as a person with a disability, which is weird, right? I use a wheelchair, right? Which I'm very hyper visible. I am very much, you know, in a chair and people would probably label me as someone who is disabled, but personally did not choose to put that label on myself. You know, to me, it was something that showed that I was weak and I did not want to be a part of. Um, especially as an upcoming medical professional, right? I had too many things counting against me. I am I'm a woman, I wear a scarf, I'm Muslim. I, I didn't want yet another thing to hold me back. And so for that reason, I didn't even choose to get services through the Disability Center at Loyola because, and I struggled. And, you know, at the time, there wasn't really a ton of people that looked like me on campus, right? Like I remember maybe seeing one or two other wheelchair users, you know, I would see a few people here and there, you know, with any sort of assistive device. So to me, it felt like if I came out and said that I needed these extra supports, that I was weak, right? Because of the framework in which I understood my disability. Um, the other thing is, you know, I, I was very much involved in the Muslim community, um, you know, that I live in. And, and so like, you know, at the time, I feel like there wasn't a ton of accommodations that were being made um, in our religious institution in the mosque, right? Um, there wasn't even an elevator, really. You know, I, so to me, you know, long and short of it all was, this is a weakness. I do not want to participate in this sort of narrative and because I am not um, the things that they're about to label me, right? So it wasn't really until I graduated, actually right before, you know, my junior year, senior year, it, my, my disability had pro progressed a little bit and I was no longer able to perform labs in the way that everyone else was performing labs. I needed support. I needed to be able to, you know, lift like a flask or be able to complete my like biology, biochemistry labs with, with someone else assisting me. Um, and really when people started to have these honest, difficult conversations with me about, is this really the path that you would like to take? It's going to be really hard for you in the future. Don't you wanna consider changing your, your degree? Um, that I really started to understand that the world is not set up for somebody like me. Um, and so, so it wasn't, I mean, it was something that would linger in the back of my mind, but I sort of am stubborn, not sort of, I am stubborn. And I said, well, I don't really care. Like I'm still going to graduate and I'm still going to try. And I did. And I applied to hundreds, if not like thousands of jobs as a researcher and would get interviewed 
and would ultimately get denied or I wouldn't hear back or, you know, we just don't think that you're the right fit for this position. Um, so, so yeah, I, you know, it, and, and so I, I started to really think about, you know, why I wasn't getting these callbacks, why, you know, why it's taking so long. I knew it would take long, but I didn't know why it was taking this long to get a job in my field. Um, and so I got involved with a worker rights center on the Northwest side of Chicago that um, it's called Arise Chicago. And they do a ton of great work around worker rights and worker justice stuff. And, um, and it was really through that that I was introduced to Access Living and sort of like, you know, just other groups that were sort of looking at disability more as, you know, as a characteristic and that society was, you know, not set up for disability and that we needed to change the landscape of society to be able to support individuals with these types of characteristics rather than really put blame on the individual. Um, and so, you know, through there, I feel like is where I truly settled into my disability identity. Um, today, I sort of um, adhere to a biopsychosocial approach um, to disability, which just says, you know, I'm not the thing that's broken. I do need some medical support here and there sometimes, um, but I am not, you know, it's society is not set up for me and that there, you know, that is why I am struggling or having issues navigating disability. So I'll stop there um, and turn it back to you. Ooh, so much. I want to let it sink in, though, um, because there's a lot there. And I want to uplift just the internalized aspect of this, right? The messages that are given as children, especially, and want to point out that theme that both of you mentioned just around this journey that has had to happen and how much the way that the world is structured has impacted the development of this identity. Um, so that is resonating a lot with me. I'm sure it's resonating with people who are listening as well. Um, and I wanna encourage people as well to you know, add any questions or any comments in the chat. Um, with it though, I really want to kind of lift up the, the piece around the world, right? And how the world is structured um, and specifically name ableism. Both of you have mentioned you know, this role of ableism and how society is shaped and what it says about these dominant narratives, what those narratives say about disability that has shaped the formation of your disability identity. Um, so I really wanna ask, ask that to both of you around, you know, how is a system of ableism? What is the role of a disability identity when it comes to ableism and a system that really sees disability as a personal problem and not a problem with the world? You know, what is that that engagement between disability identity and ableism? Um, you know, what are some of the thoughts that come up for you when you start thinking about ableism? Um, does it having a disability identity help really unpack ableism a little bit differently? Uh, I want to tease out that nuance a little bit. I think it starts off really young. Um, it's it's sort of in, it's ingrained in the way that we bring. Um, or introduce people to disability even early on. You know, the language that we use to describe disabled people, you know, special needs, special classes, per, you know, it just, it reeks a, pre a preferential treatment um, and sort of the sense of entitlement or we need to, you, society needs to do a sort of a favor rather than it's a human right to have access to these things um, and so I feel like, you know, it just, it, it starts early on. It's, it's, it's really, you know, about, you know, engaging with people, with children specifically at a very young age, you know, and I know strangers have absolutely no right to come in and ask me sort of why I'm in a wheelchair. But to me, I'm sort of excited when a child you know, has enough curiosity to be like, hey, this person navigates the world a little differently than me. 
I wonder why. Mom, why are they in a wheelchair? Why is she sitting in a wheelchair? Why do you use that thing? You know, I think that's great. It's our response to that, those questions that I think could be problematic because it's always like, not always, but most of the time parents will say, shh, no, you're not supposed to ask that. Or, um, you know, she, she just needs this because her legs don't work or she's special or God gave her this, you know, it's just, it's not, I mean, some of those answers may be better than others, but if you allow the child to ask, to engage with the person, you know, rather than giving them this false narrative of this, this person needs quote unquote special things or they're gifted, it, it almost creates this, this idea for this child even early on that this is something that is shameful to talk about, that I should not talk to the, that person. It's very isolating then for the individual. And then also, you know, as the child comes up, just learns, all right, this is a taboo topic. You know, disability is this like negative thing. Um, so. You make some wonderful points, Aziza, that I really want to piggyback off. So. Um, I think that early education is important uh, to normalizing just the presence of people uh, with disabilities in society, in today's society. I, I definitely think that the response is, like that we that is generally given from parents to children around people with disabilities can be very actually stigmatizing and otherizing because then it creates like okay, a power dynamic between, you know, you know, us people who are who are differently abled versus, you know, people who are 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 able bodied. So I, I really think that in order to erase kind of like to to blur this line and to to kind of get rid of it both or just like gradually work toward eradicating it is developing a healthier dialogue around disability and to for for parents to allow their, their children to actually approach individuals, you know, with disabilities and just ask, you know, and ask questions out of curiosity. Because the more they ask, the more the perception that disability is like an otherizing thing or is taboo or, or is the stigmatizing phenomenon that we just shouldn't be discussing, that, that view kind of is deconstructed when, when the child has clarity, especially at an early age. So, so I, I definitely think that parents should be should be considering allowing the child to explore that because you know as these children grow up we create an entire generation that's more accepting of people with disabilities rather than otherizing them. So I think that's very important, um, and I think that that's actually part of our work, kind of like deconstructing these oppressive structures and. And, and just this, this bias about people with disabilities, instead of just making these, these assumptions up in your head and just thinking that, oh, you know, but, you know poor girl, she, she can't go get an education or, or anything like that, or, you know, fo follow her dreams or get a job or things like that. Just, just ask, because I think it gives us also a sense of agency, the sense of agency that we've always deserved, that we've kind of been deprived of because, you know, other able-bodied people in society don't think to ask us about, about certain, certain things, about our needs, about what we need and what we don't need. And I think it creates this hyper dichotomy, you know, so if, you know, you're, uh, an individual with a disability, you experience people on both sides of, the, sides of the spectrum, people who want to help you and just kind of hover over you without really asking you if you need help. So they strip you over your agency that way. And then there are people who think that, you know, you're, you're using your disability to just get it easier, to just have like resources provided to you. And I think this, this dichotomy is very, very unhealthy because it reduces the individual to his or her disability. It doesn't really ask questions of intersectionality, which can, can be very, very harmful in the way we internalize 
our view of the world and and how you know and our view of ourselves really i mean i i cannot tell you how many times like i've been questioned you know why are you getting this degree you know isn't it tiring for you to to have to like procure transportation all the, i mean i don't drive so you know isn't it isn't it a struggle for you why are you doing this you know and it's like it's it's heartbreaking that to think that if i was able bodied I wouldn't be asked all these questions because being able-bodied is the default in society. No, let's normalize it to where being being a person with a disability is not otherized, or you know, it's not it's not dehumanized. And we're just you know people who do things a little differently, who need assistive devices to navigate the world. But but we shouldn't like internalize it because then it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it sends a message, especially to people, you know, to the generation of people with disabilities who are growing up, that your disability is your fault, and it's not supposed to be that way. So I'm gonna end there on my answer because I feel like I got too passionate. But <laughs> I, I want to uplift the fact that you know it's not too passionate and it's a good type of stubborn. I definitely wanted to also uplift that as well, because the reality is when you have this dominant narrative that makes a disability somebody's individual problem, as well as otherizing people who are disabled um, as not the default, as somebody who you know needs pity or needs help, and it's not a right to be able to navigate the world with what you need to be able to thrive in this space, it does take some stubbornness and it takes passion to resist kind of how those narratives are shaped, um, and especially to push back against them. I feel like both of you have you know, discussed ways where, where other people would have given you a barrier, would have been like, are you sure? Do you wanna do that? You know, maybe it's not for you. And it's like, you need that passion. You need that stubbornness um, to really be able to confront these things. Um, and I'm sure that there's that exhaustion and the shadow side of that that comes up, right? Um, but I really wanted to kind of pinpoint that a little bit around the fact that these are personality traits, thinking about intersectionality and how women should show up, right, in these spaces too, like what is seen as acceptable behavior. We need passion and we need stubbornness. And that's something that people sometimes resent, right? Where it's like, who are you to be acting this way? Um, but that is what is shifting so many different narratives as well. So I wanted to, to kind of go next to this question that has come up a little bit um, in the, the Q&A, but also both of you touched on this as well, in terms of just other people, right, and the engagement they have with you, what are some things that you wanna see done differently? The example came up around, you know, the response that parents give their kids, right, and the education that's happening for generations. Um, what are ways that you would like to see people have these conversations? What are some conversations that you think would be really important for people to be having in their spaces? Um, and what are some things you'd like to really, you know, see happen differently? Um, some changes that you'd like to see in the way things are just normally done right now? I think for me, um, I think, so I just wanted to really quickly touch on something else. I think a lot of times we talk about disability um, through the lens of children with disabilities, but we forget that there are adults with disabilities and they're around. Um, but I also challenge my disabled peers to be visible and to be okay with having this difficult conversations. And if you're not, maybe directing them to folks that are comfortable to webinars like this one that, you know, are designed to educate people. You know, um, I think that even though, you know, people do not have a right to ask you about personal things, you know, it's just the, the nature of how we are as humans. Anything that looks different, or acts different than us is something that we wanna know more about. And when I first, I think this, this has changed for me throughout the years. Um, I was very, I would be very angry when people would ask me and I would say like, like what right do you have asking me about my disability? Like, you know, you have absolutely no right to box me into this, this category with everyone else. 
But to me, I think that speaks to my com own comfortability with my own disability, that I am naturally on the defense when, when somebody asks about my disability. And if you're comfortable enough, then great, have those conversations. We need visibility. We need like people who you know, navigate the world in a different way to share their experience with the world. Even if it means just being out, doing daily things like going to the grocery store, right? Going to work. Um, it doesn't always have to be a conversation, but it could just be you being out, being you, right? Is a way for you to educate people. If you're not comfortable with having that discussion, you know, saying, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm not comfortable with sharing that part of me, but hey, maybe you can call the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. They have great webinars that could, could teach you. And at that point, you know, no matter what the reaction is by that individual, it's not on you to manage, right? You are not there to emotionally manage that person's reaction. You did what you could and just keep it moving, so. I think it touches on this issue of consent, right? I feel like a lot of these things are, it's like, can I ask you about this, right? Like that question oftentimes isn't even there and it's just the question right away. So even touch, touching on that too, right? Like, can I ask you about this, right? Like, do you have some time? Cause maybe one of us is having a bad day and doesn't wanna talk about it right now but we could talk about it later, right? So I really wanna name consent and just kind of that aspect of like asking permission, right? Just asking about comfort and boundaries. Um, to be able to start these conversations, Hala? Yes, I want to go back to this idea of consent, because even though it's okay to ask, what if like the person, you know, with a disability, he or she is like in a hurry, or it's not the best time to answer, you know, this question, you know, if I think if the, you know, the person is like, you know, genuinely curious, and would just like to learn more, you know, to become an ally of people with disabilities. I think that it's important for them to ask whether the person with the disability is available because again, you know, we we have just as much to do with our day as you are, but I think the dominant narrative is that, oh, you know, if they're vulnerable or if they're on a wheelchair, or if they're using a walker, then they probably have time, you know. But I mean that that could be a thought, right? Or that could be like a sort of implicit bias, I want to say. But um like I think for us and like for, for the person who's posing the question, I think the way you pose the question counts. And the way that you that you ask if the person is available to answer your question counts. Because, you know, like I don't think that anyone who assumes something about my disability and demands to have an answer has a right to know anything about my disability. But I believe like their tone, you know, their tone is everything. So, and their, their, their reasons for learning about my disability is everything. So I've had people, you know, come up to me and, and say, you know, genuine curiosity, you know, I've worked with people who have cerebral palsy. I just want to know what, what sort of cerebral palsy you might have. And I welcome those types of questions. But then the types of questions that come off as, oh, what happened, you know, without preamble, you know, like, like then it raises the question of why do you want to know <laughs> like you know why is this so important to you? like may I have some clarification as to why you know I'd be happy to explain it just it just depends on like I think your tone and the way you approach me with this question and, and my fellow peers with disability um, that goes, oh go ahead uh I was just gonna say that's just that's just my take on it <laughs> No, and I agree. And I think it goes back to something both of you touched on, which part of that narrative is that it's like having a disability is the worst thing that could happen to my child or to myself or, you know, there is that narrative too around this is just something that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to think about, we don't want to see it, we don't want to interact with it because what if it happens, right? Almost these ideas about things being contagious or right? There's that kind of narrative around how horrible this thing would be to happen yeah. to one of us. Yeah. And I think that's so much of that emotion that ties into that. 
um, you know, one of the local kind of uh, disability rights activists here in the Detroit area, uh, uh, Baba Baxter Jones, talks about the fact that you know everybody is either currently disabled or is temporarily abled, right? And the idea that there are so many things around disability that as you age, you know, as things change in your life, you may become disabled. And having these conversations and opening this up means that we're having much more authentic conversations about it and not just from this place of idle curiosity, right? Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to, to also kind of, Aziza, you had your mic off, so I wanted to. Yeah, I, um, I was going to just say that um, a lot of times in disability spaces in particular, we tend to idealize this, you know, the concept of disability and it's hard, right? Disability is not this easy thing that you just live with and it's a perfect world, you know? And it, I mean, it's, it's not. So it's hard to sometimes say that, oh, I'm disabled and I am proud to be disabled and I live my whole life, you know, fighting for disability rights. Um, you know, sometimes your PA doesn't show up or, you know, sometimes you know, you're just having a rough day, right? And you just don't wanna engage in that conversation, right? Um, and, you know, sort of as you were talking, I, I, I did notice that somebody put in the chat a question about faith or culture and how it sort of impacted my experience as an individual with disability. And I think it's, it's exactly what I was thinking about is, well, it's, when is it the hardest? Is usually when I'm around my own community. You know, when I'm around the, dis the disability community, quite honestly, and when I'm around my Muslim community, my Arab community, right? Like it's sort of on two opposite sense, uh, uh, sides of the spectrum. One is like rah, 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 disability is so great. And then the other side is, is disability, oh my God, shh, like don't talk about it. Or, oh my gosh, this person, you know, is disabled for them, you know? So it's sort of, I mean, to me, I feel like faith has spelled it out in, in the Quran. It specifically says this is a characteristic and there are accommodations based on your disability for worshiping. And here are the accommodations. I think where culture gets sort of, it's sort of blurred, right? What is considered quote unquote normal, you know, even in, in American culture, um, that's really the where where I think it's 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 blurred um, again. Like I was saying, um, so I just wanted to add that is that sometimes you know it's it's not one or the other. You know, it's that sort of messy middle of disability that people don't tend to talk about. That like I feel proud, but mm, not today. I'm just having a lot of lot of things to go. You know, that are going on. Um, Thank you for that. It goes toward this question around how do we hold space for like the authenticity of people's stories, right? And for that complexity um, and the layers of it instead of it just being one or the other. Because ultimately, even as a response to something like ableism, having to then pick one or the other is still a very problematic kind of development to be like, oh, in response, we then have to just like be cheering disability all the time. Um, as the only way to engage with this conversation. And it's like, how else can we have different cultures being in the space and that being seen as normal, right? Um, and so the fact of normal experiences having so much diversity and actually representing the human experience in the different spaces we're in, I think says a lot. Um, Hella, did you wanna add anything around faith in particular and kind of cultural spaces, faith spaces and disability? Um, yes, I agree with Aziza in that there are specific uh, accommodations in the Quran for people with disability. But again, the, the boundary between like the boundary between culture and religion is often blurred. So, you know, there are many people going back to this issue of consent who believe, you know, many able bodied Muslims who believe that if I help, you know, a fellow um, uh Muslim with a disability, then I get, you know, added like Hassan or, or, you know, 
added like blessings or charity or things like that. If, if I help her out, then I'm a better Muslim. And I think we need to have like a dialogue around consent in our community and, and just around uh, seeing, you know, the problem of seeing people with disabilities as a way for able-bodied individuals or for some, I don't want to generalize, some able-bodied individuals um, that think, oh, you know, if I help her, I'm, you know, I'm going to be uh, rewarded somehow. You know, so I think, I think because that's, that's, again, that's really dehumanizing. And I think that if, if, you know, um, I think if my, our able-bodied counterparts really want to help, I think we should have like questions asked and, and things like that. And, and just, just, have a conversation with the person with a disability instead of trying to help them just to like boost, you know, or for some ulterior motive or, you know, to just boost your, you know, hasana and, and your, your, your amount of like good points, I, I guess. Um, so, so I really think that, again, culture and religion is often blurred. And I think in religious spaces in particular, we need to have a conversation around how do we engage with people with disabilities in a way that helps them maintain their agency and that they're able to ask for help when they need it, but we're also able to interact with them as human, as fellow Muslims and as fellow human beings, rather than just a way for us to, to, to just get blessings and charity and rewards and, and what have you. Can I just add to your point, uh, Hala, is that, you know, this like idea of helping is creates a sort of power dynamic. It does. And that I think that like a lot of times what we need to understand as people is that we're all inter interdependent on each other yes. and that one day I might need your help and, you know, the next day you might need mine, right? And help looks different for different people. And, um, it doesn't always need to be physical help or it doesn't always need to be emotional help. Um, that every individual person has some sort of ability to or something to contribute in terms of quote unquote helping. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, I think that a lot of times people have a general like general understanding of what or what they think that we as individuals with disabilities need help with when in fact it's like you know if you want to help let I'll, I can let you know how you can help just don't assume you know what I need help with so yeah yeah and then like I get you know some Muslims who just don't do anything but are like oh let me make da'a for you you know and I just want to clarify that you know while it's very you know it's a very sweet gesture and I think it comes from pure intention it's not like my disability is not something that I want to be cured from per se. It's actually coming into my identity is, is really, for me, it was deconstructing the narrative that I want to be cured from, you know, from my disability. And I, going back to your podcast, Aziza, you raised a very in interesting point. You know, if, you know, you, you questioned if I wasn't a person with a disability, what kind of choices would I have made? You know, would they have been any different? And that really, really struck a chord with me because then I wondered, would I really want to be cured from my disability? Probably not, <laughs> because it, it led me to so many wonderful things. So, so I just want to like end like or end my um, answer. Of, to that question on that like consider whether we really are comfortable with our situation or you know or whether you want before you make that assumption that we need to we need to be cured per se you could always ask for job for more money because that's <laughs> always good and you can you can just see if people are insisting on making drop for you like, can yeah. I put in a request? Because I need all the prayers that I can get. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure the prayers that you're trying to make for me are not the ones that I want. But yeah. Exactly. You know, if, if you really want to benefit me, 
think about how you can think about how you can um what you can do in your community to help my navigating the world be more be more comforting and more accessible to 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 me you know and to my fellow able bodied peers think about what you can do like even if it's just making a ramp like leading an initiative on like installing a ramp in your local mosque <laughs> You know, and instead of thinking, oh, I should pray for her, they'll find a cure soon. No, no, Habibi, I do not want to be cured, you know. And for those who don't speak Arabic, Habibi means dear one. You know, I'm I'm using it as a term of sarcasm here, but you know. <laughs> but you get my point. <laughs> no, and thank you for that. It goes back again to the education piece, asking. Um, that aspect of agency and consent and really being able to respect people's uh, agencies, right? And choosing their own path and really asking what people need. I think that is such a fundamental human connection that needs to happen. And especially across the difference, this theme comes up in so many areas, right? When it comes to equity across race, gender, nationality, immigration status, language barriers, right? Um, what does the person actually need? The person who is most impacted by the system and by the policies that are there, what do they actually want, right? And that's something that the suppression of people's voices, whether it's the dismissal of what people need, um, this is too expensive, this is too inconvenient, this is too difficult for us to do, we don't have time to do this, like that's where a lot of these conversations end up going. Um, so, I mean, time has flown past, so I want to open the floor up. Are there, I'm sure there are other thoughts that are coming up for you as we're kind of getting into this. Um, there's so many different comments and different angles on the conversation that are in the chat. Um, and so a couple of people mentioned, you know, people of intersectionalities, how do you navigate being a woman, right? Um, thoughts about the generational element of how disability is experienced and discussed, right? Um, and especially thinking about different generations and immigrants and, right? Um, so thank you for the person who brought that up. And then in the chat as well, uh, you know, questions around um, just the term normal, which I think we touched on a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I'd love to open it up, especially that piece around generation as well as intersectionality around being a woman uh, and leaving you both space to kind of closing thoughts to uh, which this conversation is not going to be complete as we leave and that's okay. That's totally fine, right? So yeah, let me give it back, hand it back to either one of you to kind of touch on these things, but also some closing thoughts. Um, in terms of the gener generational um, stuff that goes on, I think um, I would just say that they're, they're, you're not gonna win over everybody and to sort of meet people where they're at, right? Um, I think that overall, you know, the more you interact with people, the more people will, will really start to understand, well, like Ziza is not that much different than me, right? Especially like older generation, um, you know, um, I don't think my grandmother ever really understood, you know, what, um, all goes into being somebody like me. She she saw that I quote unquote look normal. You know, my legs move a little bit, my arms move, and she never really understood why I couldn't walk. Right. Um, so just sort of meet people where they're at and sort of pick and choose what conversations you have. So as not to make enemies, but bring people in. Right. Um, I think that when when you can it's about calling people in to the conversation rather than calling them out and i think i'll leave with that so yeah i definitely want to agree with aziza on that you raised some phenomenal points tonight aziza and i just want to commend you on that um so i think for me too the generational conversation is very important particularly as you know i have one grandmother one, one more surviving um grandparent left, which is my grandmother on my mother's side. And I remember her telling me, you know, when I had gone down to Lebanon, um, you know, when I was getting ready to pray, she was like, you know, Hala, I don't think you need to pray. Why are you troubling yourself with that? And, 
I think, you know, for me, I just, you know, wanted to clarify, you know, grandma, you know, here's, you know, why prayer is important to me and here's how I can do it. And I think that when she saw, you know, that I can actually pray sitting and things like that, she she understood a little bit more. So I think uh, what Aziza said about calling people into the conversation and meeting them where they're at is actually very important rather than rather than just getting like angry with them for not understanding i think it would be much more um just just a warmer conversation in general you know to have with your loved ones about what you know your limitations are and what you know you actually can do what what you are able to do uh so i you know i will leave it at that in terms of the generational aspect so so just basically so sorry just want to add like one more thing so just basically um you know trying to explain to to our older uh family members that you know while i do need some help with a b and c there are other things that i don't require help with grandma but thank you and you know i appreciate you and and make sure that they know that their their effort and and their um Inquisitiveness, I want to say, is appreciated and, and that their curiosity is appreciated because it doesn't always come from a malicious place. And I think, you know, as disability activists, we tend to think that, you know, questions might be asked from a negative place. But again, you know, if, if a child asks and then a parent responds to that in, in a constructive way, then that's not a problem. Or like if if they're asking just because you know they they want to get to know better then then that that shouldn't be something that we should antagonize i i think it should be something that we should welcome in order to create more allies across the generational divide thank you so much so just as a closing um the conversation is so rich and i know some people note noted that in the chat as well so i really want to send my appreciation to our panelists Thank you so much um, for being able to speak to your experiences and hold that complexity in your answers and your responses. Um, this community is such a diverse community, right? And so there are so many stories, perspectives, um, you know, insights that people across the range of disability and then thinking about the intersectionality of other identities as well. There's so much richness. And so I really wanna encourage people as we're kind of closing out for today, to really hearken back to that relationship piece of being able to have relationships and listen to the stories, um, as well as share and amplify these stories and these voices as well, to make sure that we have a world where all of these different identities are not just represented, but also respected, also thought of and included in different ways. So that the world reflects who all of us are, right? Um, and is a space that we can all thrive. So thank you all for joining us um, again, drop in the bucket of all the conversations that, you know, I hope that we are able to continue to have. Thank you to the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Um, thank you for you all attending today. And I hope that we can stay connected and continue um, and encourage you to have these conversations with the people in your lives as well. So thank you. Have a good night. Peace to all of you. Bye everyone. Thank you.